Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, we're honored today to, um, to have Andreas Kraus visiting us. Uh, Andreas, uh, we know very well. He was um, one of our fabulous interns over the years. Uh, we had here a couple of years ago now, three years ago maybe, um, three summers ago. Uh, time really flies. Uh, Andreas is a assistant professor at Caltech, uh, um, and uh, he finished his PhD at CMU in 2008. Um, he has a number of awards, including an NSF uh, 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 career award. Um, and uh, in sitting with him, uh, hearing about his latest results, um, I have to say that uh, I'm very excited about the direction uh, he, he's gone um, in generalizing the work that he's so well known for during his dissertation um, that, he, that he did for that, for that uh, era of his life. This new approach uh, on adaptive submodularity really gets to the notion of how we apply some of those those interesting submodularity results to um, uh, the actual case where information is revealed dynamically over time, which is, is indeed the general case. So go for it. Thank you so much, Eric, for inviting me for this kind introduction. Welcome, everyone, to my talk. It's always a pleasure to be here at Microsoft Research. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about some brand new results uh, in the area of active learning and stochastic or interactive optimization using a generalization of the notion of submodular functions to adaptive policies that I'll tell you about as we go on. This is mainly based on joint work with Daniel Golovin, who's a postdoc at Caltech, and the uh, last part of the talk is also joint work with uh, Dave Ray, uh, as a grad student at Caltech. Okay, <clears throat> so before I get to the new stuff, I'll uh, just bring everyone up to speed by giving a quick introduction of what so much already is and some of the locations I've been working on in the past. So I've been really interested in uh, problems of optimized information gathering. So for example, we've been working uh, with roboticists at USC and UCLA on using robotic boats in order to monitor rivers and lakes uh, for, for pollution. We've also been collaborating uh, with similar engineers back at Carnegie Mellon um, on placing sensors in drinking water distribution networks for uh, detecting contaminations, but also uh, looking at sensor placement problems and activity recognition, um, intelligent buildings, um, but also looking at more general notions of what sensing means and applying some of the uh, ideas to, uh, to information gathering problems uh, and information retrieval problems uh, on the web. So in all these problems, our goal is to learn something about the state of the world, such as the water quality in a particular geographic region, and we can do so by placing sensors or making measurements, conducting experiments, which are typically expensive and we can only make a limited number. And the key question common to all these problems is how can we most cost-effectively get the most useful information? And this is really an instance of a fundamental challenge in machine learning in AI, namely the problem of how can we automate notions of curiosity and serendipity. Since this is such a fundamental problem, it's been studied in a lot of areas, including experimental design, uh, decision theory, operations research, AI, machine learning, spatial statistics, robotics, sensor networks. Uh, but most of the existing techniques that are out there can be broadly grouped into two categories. So there's heuristic algorithms that work well, really well in some applications, but uh, they're not theoretically well understood and can potentially do arbitrarily badly. And for some applications, it could be problematic. There's also um, algorithms that have the more ambitious goal of trying to find the optimal solution, and they include techniques like mixed integer programming or solving partially observable Markov decision processes. But these techniques are typically very difficult to scale to large problems. So what I'm really interested is in developing algorithms that both have strong theoretical guarantees and scale to really large problems. And I'm not just working on the theoretical side, but really like to apply the results on actual applications. So as a running example, let's think about the problem of deciding where to put a bunch of sensors in a building to monitor temperature, for example, to detect whether there's a fire or not. Okay? So in generally, we take a probabilistic approach. So one way to do this is, for example, we could have a random variable at every location S that models the temperature at this particular location. And they're spatially correlated, so we have some joint distribution that models this correlation among the temperature, which is typically informed by some physical understanding of the phenomenon. Now, we can't observe the temperature directly, but we can make noisy observations by putting out sensors. Okay? And so if you have a sensor at location S, then we would get the sensor value Ys, which is some noisy copy of the true underlying temperature Xs. 
Okay? And then we start uh, with in a Bayesian setting where we have a prior distribution over the temperature, modeling the correlation along with the likelihood function that uh, characterizes the assumptions about the noise of the sensors. Okay? Once we have such a model, we can start talking about utility of making observations. So suppose we start with the uniform distribution, where we assume, for example, that uh, the temperature is cold, normal, or hot with equal probability at all locations. Now, if we have a sensor placed at location Y1, it tells us there's high temperature there. We can do Bayesian inference to calculate the posterior distribution, which may indicate that it's probably um, <coughs> likely that uh, at location X1, there's higher than usual temperature. And also, probably at locations close by, the temperature is probably higher than usual through the correlation. Now, typically, we'd have to make decisions or take actions based on this posterior distribution, and therefore would prefer uh, posterior distributions to help us make these decisions more effectively. So for now, we'll just assume that we have some reward function that takes this posterior distribution and tells us how useful that is. And I'll give you examples as we go on in this talk. If you make a different observation, say cold temperature at location uh, 3, then we get a different posterior distribution, which gives us a different reward. Now, there's various different examples of those reward functions that have been considered. Um, <clears throat> one is, so if, you, if you're in this situation where you want to decide whether there's a fire or not, then uh, we have to ask the question, should we raise an alarm? Right? So we have two actions. We could raise an alarm or not raise an alarm. And the world could be in two states. There could be a fire or there could not be a fire. And if there is a fire and we don't raise an alarm, bad things happen. Similarly, if there is no fire, but we do raise an alarm, we have a false positive, if you have too many of those, then people won't believe our system anymore, and eventually if bad things will happen too. Okay? <clears throat> now, if we knew the uh, correct state the world is in, we could just take the optimal action. But the problem is that we don't know that. We only have a belief about what the state of the world is, the posterior distribution, and the best thing we can really do is take the action that maximizes the expected utility. But this gives us a way of quantifying the usefulness of a particular posterior distribution. We can just um, <coughs> use the expected uh, value of the, uh, of the, uh, so, so, so the um, maximum expected utility when acting optimally based on our posterior distribution. And that's called the decision theoretic value of information. It's been an extremely useful and powerful concept um, all through uh, AI and decision theory. Now, in some applications, we may not a priori have a utility function. So we may only want to have posterior distributions that are as certain as possible. Okay. And one way of quantifying this uncertainty is the notion of Shannon entropy. Or if you think about spatial prediction problems, if you use robots to survey lakes uh, or try to figure out what the temperature is everywhere in this building, you may care about, for example, the mean squared uh, prediction error based on our observations. So these are all ways of taking a posterior distribution and turning them into a utility. But there's other uh, objective functions uh, that are useful and uh, have been used in practice. Now we have these reward functions, and now we can use these in order to quantify how useful any given set of sensor locations would be. The issue is that a priori we don't know when we place some sensor somewhere what they are going to tell us. Okay, so the only thing we can really do is average with respect to the observations that these sensors will likely do times the reward we would get under those particular observations. Okay, so this gives us an expected value of information for any set of sensors that we may want to place. And now this is an objective function that we can try to optimize. Okay, and the simplest question we can ask is, well, for example, what's the best set of k locations to place sensors? <clears throat> now, the first thing we did is we actually tried to understand for what kind of problems can we solve uh, this problem uh, exactly. And it turns out for some problems, you can actually solve it exactly. And this depends on the structure of this underlying model. So it turns out if this underlying graphical model is a chain, like a Markov chain. So for example, you have a conditional random field or a hidden Markov model, and you'd like to label the hidden frames of that uh, hidden Markov model, then you can actually find the optimal value of information efficiently. Okay? But it turns out that if you just tr try to slightly generalize that from chains to trees, this problem suddenly becomes really, really hard. Right? And as soon as you start, to start about, uh, talking about spatial correlations, you have much more complex dependencies than, uh, than simple chains. So the problem suddenly becomes uh, really hard, NP to the PP complete. We can't expect to find the optimal solution. So instead of trying to find the optimal solution, let's try to at least find a good solution, a good approximate solution. <clears throat> so probably the simplest approximate algorithm we could think about is the greedy algorithm, which is being used a lot. So we would just start having no sensors and iteratively place the sensor at the location where it increases our value the most. Okay, so you place one sensor at a time, uh, see how objective function increases, and we stop after we've placed all k sensors, but we never change any decisions we've already made. And the question is, how well does this simple algorithm do? So one way of trying to answer this is to run experiments. So we could take some temperature data, uh, run the greedy algorithm to maximize, for example, the improvement in, uh, in information gain, 
And for, if you have a small enough problem, you can actually find the optimal solution uh, through exhaustive enumeration. And it turns out that the greedy algorithm gets us really close to the optimal solution. And in fact, we see this in a number of different problems. And so the, uh, the question is, is there any th uh, justification of why the greedy algorithm should do well? Okay? And it turns out that the key insight for analyzing this greedy algorithm is the following natural notion of diminishing returns. So suppose you have two placements, A and B. In A, you've placed two senses so far, Y1 and Y2. In setting B, you have three more senses, three, four, and five. And now let's consider about the additional value that a new sensor would give us in either of those situations. If we add the sensor S to the first set, we gain a lot of additional coverage, a lot of additional information. Versus if we place the sensor to the same location in the second deployment, we only get a little bit of additional information. We can formalize this uh, uh, diminishing returns property using the combinatorial notion of submodular functions. And the set function f that takes a set of locations and outputs a value is called submodular whenever we have a set A that's contained in some superset B. And we consider adding new element s to either of those sets. We gain more by adding this element to the small set than by adding it to the large set. So this is exactly captures what's, what's going on here. And so in formulas, just means that f of A union s minus f of A is greater than or equal to f of B union s minus f of B. Okay? And so for the sake of, con uh, of a notation, we just use this notation delta s given A as the marginal benefit of adding this element s to the set A. Okay? Now, why did I tell you about this? So first of all, uh, we can actually show that in the sensor placement uh, applications, this, this information gain is in fact a submodular function. And so why is this useful? Why did I tell you about this? Well, it turns out that um, it's known that you can maximize uh, submodular functions using the greedy algorithm and get guarantees about that. So whatever the greedy algorithm gives you, the placement of the greedy algorithm, obtains at least a constant fraction of about 63% of the optimal value. Okay? And in fact, for information gain, uh, that's the best possible ratio you can get among any efficient algorithm. So in some sense, it's a it's really good uh, algorithm to use uh, for this kind of problem. Okay? And so in, uh, in my dissertation research, we've been pushing this um, idea in a, a number of different directions. And so um, basically all these applications here can be cast as the problem of maximizing some submodular um, objective function uh, subject to some, some interesting constraints. We've been working on algorithms, some are characterizing when these problems are submodular and so on. <clears throat> but what all these problems are in common is that you want to find a set of observations you want to make in advance before obtaining any kind of measurements. So for example, you'd like to decide on the locations where you want to place your sensors before you actually get to see any measurements. In that sense, these results are results about non-adaptive optimization problems. They're non-adaptive against observations you would possibly make. Now, there's a lot of really interesting uh, information gathering problems where you want to be adaptive. So one example is medical diagnosis. Suppose we are a veterinarian and we would like to diagnose a sick puppy. So what you can do is you can run some tests. So for example, we could measures, uh, measure the, the puppy's heart rate. Okay? And then uh, depending on the outcome, whether it has a heart rate or not, decide on the next uh, test uh, that we want to run. So for example, take an x-ray. Depending on how that looks, we decide on the next test to run, take a blood sample, and so on. And what we want to do is we want to diagnose this puppy um, as cheaply as possible. But all the tests that we run can depend on the measurements we've done in the past. Okay? So now we're interested in finding no longer a set of tests, a fixed set of tests, but a policy, a decision tree that's adaptive to the observations we've already made. Okay? Now the issue is that now we try to optimize over those policies instead of over these sets. So you can't use the notion of submodular set functions in order to analyze these algorithms anymore. And so the question is, that we ask is, is there some natural generalization of this notion of submodular functions to these adaptive uh, policies? <clears throat> to give you some intuition about this problem, let's talk about the really simple submodular optimization problem, one of the most natural ones, uh, the set cover problem. And let's just think about it in the context of sensor placement. So we have a bunch of uh, possible locations, one through n. And all these locations are associated with some kind of sensing regions. Right? So if you have a sensor at location S1, then uh, you're going to see the green area here, this set WS, right? WS1. Okay? And now a sensor placement is just a subset of the locations, A. And the total value of that placement is just the total area covered by the regions associated with the uh, elements that you pick. Okay? So you have this function f that takes sets of locations and outputs just the union of the elements contained in all the sets that you pick. Now that's a simple example of a submodular function, fairly easy to see. And the set cover problem has a very natural adaptive analog. Okay? So what you could think about is 
<coughs> suppose you're in a setting where you don't know about what these sensing regions are in advance. So if you put out the sensor, for example, a camera, then it could either observe all the way the hallway, for example, or there could be some obstacle. Doors could be open and so on, and the uh, sensing region gets reduced by that. Or the sensor could fail and you don't get to see anything in advance. And you don't know ahead of time before you actually place the sensor. Okay? Now, in this situation, what you can think about is every sensor is actually associated with a collection of sets, collection of sensing regions, and there's a random variable. For example, for location three, there's a random variable x3 that tells us which of those sets gets realized. Okay? And this example, there's two sets, a yellow set and a green set. And if variable x3 takes value one, then the yellow set gets realized. If it takes value zero, the green set gets realized. Okay? So the uh, set that is picked depends now on the realization of those random variables. And now you can think about trying to come up with adaptive um, policies where you pick a location, then the set gets revealed to you, then you pick another location, again the set gets revealed to you, and so on. It's a very natural adaptive uh, analog. And now you can define an objective function. So you can do this if you have a bunch of sensors, right? You know, have, have all these sensors. And now the value of a placement A in a particular world state joint realization of all those random variables is just the union of all those sets uh, that are parameterized by, the, uh, by these random variables. Okay, so it's a very natural analog of the set cover problem that's been studied in the literature. And more formally, what uh, we're going to do is we have, so the kind of optimization problems we're we going to study is settings where we have a collection of items, one through n, and with each of those items we have some random variable associated with it. And we have some objective function f that takes a subset of locations we pick, subsets of items, and a world state, which is the joint realization of all the random variables, okay, which sets get realized where, and tells us how useful that is. Okay? And now what we can do is we can quantify the value of a policy. So the situation is that depending on which, so the policy is some kind of decision tree, right? so depending on the test, you, you decide which set you pick. Now, uh, you can... So for every possible world state xv, you could possibly realize a different set. Right, so you have some set pi of xv that's realized if the world is in state xv. Okay? So the value of a policy is just the expected value of the sets that are picked by the policy under the respective world state. And you average over all states the world can be in. Okay? So you can think about, basically, you have a decision tree, uh, the realization of the world tells you which path you take down this decision tree, at the end, at the leaves, you get some value, and look at the average value. Okay? And now you can try to maximize over these policies. That's a well-defined uh, optimization problem. Now the issue is that there's a lot more policies than sets, and this is strict generalization because you could just set all the outcomes to have uh, one, one single value in which this problem re uh, reduces to the classical uh, set function optimization problem. And so clearly the, uh, the problem is hard and it's uh, hard to approximate. So there's very strong hardness results for this problem. Okay? Now, uh, since this is a hard problem, we can't expect to find the optimal solution in general, so let's try to find a good solution. Right? So what's the natural algorithm we could try? Well, we could try to use some kind of adaptive variant of the greedy algorithm. So how would that work? So suppose we already have made some observations. So in the sensor placement problem, that means we've seen the realization of some of the sets. So for example, sensor 1 and 3 have been realized with this green set. And now we can look at not the marginal benefit, but the expected marginal benefit of adding new sensor S2 conditioned on those observations. Okay, and we use the notation delta S given XA to denote this expected marginal benefit conditioned on a particular observation XA. Yes? So you don't know whether you're going to get the green or the yellow when yeah. you place S2. Yeah. Do you know what the green and the yellow are? You know what they are and you have a distribution over how likely they are. Okay. Okay. Good. And so now, once you have these, uh, these marginal benefits, you can uh, really Im uh, uh, easily implement an adaptive greedy algorithm that just starts having no sets uh, and, and have, having nothing selected, and then iteratively just add the set that maximizes the expected marginal benefit condition of what you've seen. Right? That's the greedy algorithm. Uh, then once it picked this element, it observes it, does Bayesian update based on the observation, and adds it to the set. And to see how this works in this, in this uh, sensor selection kind of problem here, so if these three sensors, we want to select two of them. So the one that has the highest marginal benefit, given nothing, is sensor S2. So the greedy policy starts with sensor S2. 
Okay? Now that we've picked it, one of those sets gets realized. So for example, the green one gets realized. Okay? Now, conditioned on that, I can look at the marginal benefit of S1 or S2. And since there's quite a lot of overlap of, S, of the green set with S3, I may want to pick S1. Right? Condition this green outcome, I pick this one. And once I've picked it, I get to see which sets gets realized, maybe this yellow one. Okay? But if we rewind and instead of the, uh, of the green one, the yellow one gets realized, right? then it may now be better to actually pick sensor S3 instead of S1. Right? So we pick this one, and one of those gets realized, and that's our value. Okay? So the greedy algorithm now doesn't construct a set, but actually a policy. And the question is, how does this policy compare against the optimal policy? Okay? And so we know that in the classical setting where we want to pick sets, if the objective function is submodular, then the greedy algorithm is going to give us good solutions. So the question is, uh, is there some notion of adaptive version of, of submodularity? And here's the uh, generalization that we came up with, and it's based on these expected marginal benefits. So you call some objective function f and some distribution um, adaptive submodular if these conditional marginal benefits are monotonically decreasing in the set size. So what this basically means is that if we are in a state x, uh, so if we compare two situations, xa where we've made some observations, and xb where we've made more observations than in xa, then the marginal benefit of, uh, of any new item s conditional on xa has to be greater than or equal to uh, the marginal benefit condition on xb. So it's just a natural generalization of set function, right? In the set function's case, you just had delta s given a is greater than or equal to delta s given b. Now you don't just condition on the set, but you condition on the set plus the resulting observation. So That's the I'm trying to figure out if that's, that's more restrictive, how much more restrictive that is, to, I mean, to, to, to find that kind of, of submodularity. So uh, that's a really good question. I'll give you some examples arguing that this is uh, a useful notion and, and a bunch of applications. Okay? But of course, that's, I mean, it's a really new concept, and I think there's a lot of, to be studied to somehow say which problems satisfy this property. I mean, sitting here, I can imagine cases where it, it, it's, 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 it's not. There's certainly cases where it's not. Yeah. And I give, give easy examples where it's not. We can talk about them later. I have some. Okay. Good. And also what you need is monotonicity. So you have some notion of adaptive monotonicity, which just says that the expected marginal benefits always have to be positive. So whenever I add an element, it increases my value and expectation. Okay? And now what you can show is that if f is adaptive submodular and adaptive monotonic with respect to this distribution p, then the a nice result about the, uh, the greedy algorithm still carries on. Okay? So the greedy algorithm is a constant fraction of 63% of the optimal value. Okay, so this still holds, and in fact, a lot of the other nice properties that classical submodular functions have still carry over to the adaptive set. And I'll give you some examples as we go on. So let's just uh, see what this means for this adaptive set covering problem. That's been studied quite a bit, both the maximization version, where we want to find a collection of sets that has maximum value. It's been studied by Asbert Poor et al. Uh, <clears throat> so in this case, the greedy algorithm gets, gets this one minus one over E guarantee. But we can also think about uh, some notion of coverage where we, uh, for example, want to find the cheapest policy that covers the entire building. Right? That's, uh, that always uh, makes sure that um, all the locations are covered. Okay? Uh, and that is a natural generalization of the set cover problem. And for that, it also gives you a guarantee, which is basically um, optimal uh, as a matching lower bound from classical set cover. Okay, so this is uh, about set cover. But now let's talk about some, uh, okay, so this is some theoretical results, so you may not care about theorems, but here's some practical uh, results that you may actually care, uh, that may actually be even more useful from an applications perspective. And um, it's the fact that you can use lazy evaluations to run the greedy algorithm. And that's something that's been sh shown to be extremely useful in the classical set function case, and also carries over to the adaptive setting. And the way it works is this. So you start with the set A of observations, S1 through SI, and now what the greedy algorithm does in every iteration, it has to pick the item SI plus one that maximizes the expected marginal benefit, condition on what if seen. Okay? So, so what you can look at is the expected marginal benefit and, uh, and just tries to find the, find, find the maximum of those. Now, adaptive submodularity implies some really interesting fact about these uh, marginal benefits through the course of the greedy algorithm. It implies that if you fix a particular item S, 
then its expected marginal benefits have to be monotonically decreasing over the course of the greedy algorithm. OK, so that's the easy consequence of submodularity, which basically means that if you have some iteration uh, where you have this yellow marginal benefit for item S, then at some subsequent iteration, the marginal benefit uh, can, can never be more than it was in the previous iteration. So these marginal benefits can never increase. So why is this useful? Well, you can exploit it um, in, uh, in a really uh, interesting variant of the greedy algorithm called the lazy greedy algorithm. And the original version of that for his classical submodular functions due to uh, Minou in uh, 1978. But <clears throat> it, uh, so now we show that we can actually generalize and make use of the same uh, insights for the, for the adaptive setting. And so the first iteration uh, is just business as usual. So we can calculate the marginal benefits with respect to all sets. Okay? And now uh, here the best one, for example, maybe, uh, maybe item A. So we pick A. And now in the next iteration, Naively, we would have to recompute the marginal benefit for uh, all four remaining elements. Okay, so we have to do four function evaluations. So this could be expensive. So now what you could do instead is instead of recomputing all of them, let's just use the previous values. Let's just sort them and take the best guess as the one that has the highest value before. So let's try to look at how, how good D would be. Of course, the, the last value is only an upper bound on what's true value, so we have to recompute it. Okay? And by recomputing it, the value could go down. But if it goes down, then we'll just resort it and put it into this queue. Now, the next best guess would be B. And if we recompute it and it has, still has the same value, then we now know that it has to be the second best item. So we don't ever have to look at E and C again. Okay? So it means that in this simple example, we save these two function evaluations. That doesn't seem like a lot, but in practice can matter a whole lot. Okay? And here, just one, uh, one, one preliminary uh, experiment that we did is so we look at this uh, adaptive sensor placement problem. I won't talk too much in detail about this. We take data from 350 traffic sensors on a highway in California. And um, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to adaptively select these sensors in order to maximize the value. And we compare the naive greedy algorithm with this lazy, uh, lazy greedy algorithm. And we get performance improvements by a factor of 30 to 30, uh, 40 in this problem. And that can make a difference in practice. And this classical setting, um, there, there were some studies showing it can be even bigger, uh, bigger improvements. So practically, that uh, is a really important benefit that you get if your objective function is adaptive submodular. It's another nice consequence of submodular functions is maybe that you can calculate data-dependent bounds. So I told you about this 1 minus 1 ver e bound. And in some sense, this, this bound is, is a worst case bound that holds over, no matter what the problem instance is. Also, what all the problem instances are, okay? <clears throat> but uh, problem instances that you, op uh, that you work with in practice may not be as adversarial as in this worst case analysis. So what Sumatulati lets you do is to calculate some more instance dependent or problem dependent bounds that are often much tighter than these offline data dependent bounds. So you can run your algorithm and then use Sumatulati to get some certificate on how close you are to the optimal solution. Okay? And that's something that's known for classical submodular functions, too. And it also carries over to the adaptive setting. I won't talk too much about detail, but what this is, this is again from this placement problem. X is the number of sensors that are picked. Y axis is the performance. The blue curve is the value of the adaptive greedy algorithm. And the black curve is just if you use the 1 minus 1 over E bound that I told you about before. And the red curve here is what you, what you get from these data dependent bounds. So you can see that it's tighter than this 1 minus 1, 1, 1 over E bound. Okay, so, so in practice, you can get problem-specific bounds uh, just knowing that your objective function is submodular. And uh, what, what you can also do is you can get these bounds for any algorithm that you may run, not just the, uh, not just the adaptive greedy algorithm. Okay, so this is um, some more reasons of why submodularity is useful. Now I'll tell you about some more applications, because so far we've only talked about some of the sensor, uh, the set selection, adaptive set covering problem. Um, so let me talk about some, uh, some other applications. And one really interesting application is in viral marketing. Okay? So uh, suppose we'd like to get a new product in the market and we want to convince people to buy it. Okay, so one, the idea behind viral marketing is that we can give the product for free to a bunch of people and then they hopefully convince their friends who convince their friends and um, we uh, maximize our impact. And of course the question is, which set of people should we give the product for free to, to maximize our expected influence. And that's a problem that's been studied by, uh, by uh, David Kempich and Klemberg and Eva Tardish in a really nice uh, K uh, KDD paper. 
And they show, so, so, so and they have a particular model of how influence propagates. So they take the social network of people and uh, annotate all these edges by probabilities. And so suppose we give the free phone, a uh, free, free product, maybe a phone to Alice, then Alice uh, can try to convince their friends. So for example, has 30% chance to influence Bob, which may fail, but 50% chance to influence Charlie, which may succeed. Then uh, Charlie is influenced, buys the phone himself. Then uh, he tries to influence Bob again, which may fail, Dorothy, and so on. Right? And over time, you see how this influence propagates through this network. Okay? And so what uh, Kempe, Kleinberg, and Tata showed is that the expected number of people influenced is a submodular function of the initial set of people that you select. Okay, so if you want to run an advertisement campaign where you say you have a budget to give out 10 phones, right, or some number of phones, then you can use this, uh, the, the algorithm to find a near optimal set of, of people that maximize the expected influence. Okay, but this result is about the non-adaptive setting where you have to commit to the people in advance. This has a very natural adaptive analog, right? So in, in what in, in practice you may want to do is actually run your marketing, uh, marketing campaign in stages, right? So you say you give the phone to a bunch of people first, then see how successful they are in influencing, you learn from that, then you pick another set of people, condition them what you've done, and so on, right? So it's a very, very natural adaptive analog. And uh, that's, so here, for example, we may pick Alice first, get to see how successful she was influencing people, or maybe some, uh, some information of that, and then pick Fiona for, uh, second, uh, and, uh, and so on, get to see how, how effective she is, okay? And turns out that's an adaptive submodular problem, okay? So that's already a maybe more compelling application than this adaptive set covering uh, problem. And so, so this adaptive greedy algorithm gets you this one minus one over E guarantee to the optimal adaptive policy now, okay? And you can all use these nice tricks uh, with lazy evaluations, online bounds, and so on. <clears throat> okay, so now we start talking about uh, information gathering and active learning problems. So now let's finally get to active learning. Yes? I have a question. So with this uh, 1 minus 1 over E yeah. ratio, you're comparing to the best uh, optimal adaptive solution. But can you say something about how good you are best compared to the best um, non-adaptive solution? Uh, that's a good question. So the, so the, uh, the adaptivity gap uh, so we have, <coughs> so, so, so it turns out for maximization, it's not entirely clear how big this adaptivity gap is. For coverage, if you, for example, want to achieve, say, 90% market segmentation, right, or in a set covering problem, you want to uh, cover everything, you can show that there's very, uh, very large gaps. So you can do a lot better by being adaptive than by non being adaptive. So, for example, for adaptive set cover, there's an adaptivity gap uh, due to um, Grimmans and Mirokni of N over log N. I don't know it for the viral marketing problem, but for set cover it is. Okay? Good. <clears throat> Good. So this is the um, so, so the viral marketing. Now let's talk about active learning. Okay? In particular, let's talk about some of this diagnostic problems. We'd like to diagnose the disease, so we can run tests. We start with a bunch of hypotheses. So this these pictures here are just different hypotheses for diseases that this, uh, the puppy may have. Okay? And now we take a Bayesian approach. We have a prior over hypotheses, um, and we have some likelihood function over the outcomes. And let's start with this sim uh, the setting where the observations are deterministic, conditioned on the true hypothesis. Okay. So if you so any particular disease uniquely determines the outcome of the test. So there's no noise whatsoever. Okay. If you're in this setting, then any test cuts away part of the hypothesis. So for example, if you find out that x1 equals 1, it eliminates some of the hypotheses. If you find out x3 equals 0, it again cuts out some part of these hypotheses. Okay? But the problem is, of course, that a priori we don't know the outcome of the test. Okay? In particular, if you pick test as x2, then we could either eliminate the two hypotheses on the left or the two hypotheses on the right. You don't know a priori which is which. Right? Okay? Uh, and of course, what you want to do is, so, so in some sense, we would like to, so it looks like some kind of adaptive set cover problem now, right? Because we'd like to cover all the hypotheses except the true one. Okay. And um, <clears throat> now, of course, the question is, how should we test, right? And one natural objective is just to look at the expected reduction in mass of the hypotheses that we eliminate from the test. So you look at every test, look at both outcomes, see how much hypothesis do I rule out, and uh, average over these outcomes uh, weighted by the likelihood of the outcome. Okay, that is called generalized binary search. It turns out to be equivalent to maximizing the information gain in the Shannon sensor. This problem, 
and um, turns out it's adaptive submodular. Okay, and I want to quickly show you why it is adaptive submodular. So uh, let's take. So what you need to do is you need to show that the value of some test x has to monotonically decrease as we gather more and more information. Suppose initially we have some prior probability of these hypotheses, the three on the left, uh, and we call it B naught, and so for blue, blue naught, and on the right we have some prior probability for, uh, for the green hypotheses, right, G naught. And it's not hard to show that the initial expected marginal benefit of this test X can be calculated as two times G naught, B naught divided by G naught plus B naught. Won't go through this in detail, but it's really easy to show. Now, <coughs> suppose we run some tests, we gather some information, so that cuts away some hypothesis, so um, both the blue and the green mass decrease. So now we can look at what is the expected marginal benefit of this test X after we've seen these observations. Okay, and that turns out to be two times uh, uh, G1 B1 divided by G1 plus B1. Okay, now it turns out it's fairly easy to show that whenever B0 is uh, greater than or equal to B1 and G0 is greater than or equal to B1, uh, G1, which is always the case if you cut away mass of these hypotheses, then uh, some of the, the final marginal benefit has to be uh, less than or equal to the initial marginal benefit, which proves adaptive submodularity. Okay? So the proof fits on one slide. Okay, now that means that the greedy algorithm for this general binary search is near optimal. In fact, that's not the new insight. There's been a lot of work in this problem. Some of the results have been rediscovered, some extensions and, uh, uh, and the guarantees have been improved over time. The currently best known approximation ratio for this optimal decision tree problem, uh, uh, no, noise free, is four times a log of one over p min, where p min is the smallest probability among any hypothesis. And it turns out that um, using this insights that the objective function is adaptive so much, you can actually improve this bound. So you can get rid of this factor of four. Um, okay, so, so that means that somehow this adaptive submodularity analysis is, is tighter than all these existing analyses. But what, I'm, what, what I think is, um, is more interesting is that the fact that this adaptive greedy algorithm is guarantee is a simple consequence from the fact that the objective function is adaptive submodular. Okay, so all these existing uh, algorithms have to set up machinery for specifically analyzing this particular problem, right? So there's been a lot of work in trying to analyze adaptive set cover, uh, analyze this, these active learning problems, uh, this file marketing problem, and so on. And it turns out the, the reason why they work is that the objective function is adaptive submodular. And you don't lose anything by the subtraction. You actually get better, uh, better bounds. So, so how does adaptive for <coughs> VOI compared to um, naive myopic? Next best. Let me get to that. Okay. Awesome. Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes? My question is about the domain you are working on. Yeah. So are you assuming that each observation you make, each task you yeah. make, eliminates some of the possibilities yes. at each step? Yeah. But there's some, there can be some cases where like, you learn something, but it doesn't really eliminate. That's what I'm going to get at. Okay. So, so, this is, so I'm talking about the classical setting. This is opt called optimal decision free problem. It's a well-defined mathematical problem. Assumes that the tests are noise-free. That means that every observation rules out some hypotheses, right? So that's because they, you multiply with, with zero, right, if the, if, the, uh, if the likelihood is zero. But there can be also cases where a combination of tasks eliminate. Yeah, of course, of course, but that happens. Mm -hmm. That is all modeled here. Okay? Good. So uh, this is okay, no, not noise-free, okay? Now... Uh, in practice, there's always noise. Okay, so if you have sensors, they always have sensor noise. Uh, these medical tests could have false positives, false negatives, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, all these results for the noise-free case don't carry over. And you, you find this active learning when you have a static model that's, when, when you, that you're using to do diagnosis or using the phase active learning. It's depending on who you ask. Right? So, so, so if you uh, if you uh, so you could call it um, a sequential Bayesian experimental design, you could call it active learning, you could call it adaptive VOI. So, the, so I'm asking about being uh, cutting, cutting, you know, studying hairs. I, I, there's also one like one reserve that term for how you might use your methods to actually choose new data that's unlabeled, for example. Yeah, but uh, so, so it turns out you can easily cast, for example, pool-based active learning from that perspective. We can talk about that offline. But it's the same model. 
it's just using a different. Right, I was suggesting you might want to okay. dis distinguish how you describe the application. Okay. So, so in the paper, we actually talk about the learning problem, but so I just want to tell you uh, about the UI. So. No, I haven't personally ever used active learning to, okay. to describe the task of doing diagnosis with a fixed model. Okay, so let's call it active diagnosis. Sure. Sure. Diagnosis. Okay, diagnosis. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, adapt there. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So diagnosis. Okay, so so the problem now, if you have noise, then tests ex exactly what what Asia mentioned uh, can happen, right? So the tests no longer eliminate uh, uh, diseases; they only make them less likely. Okay, and it turns out that uh, that um, breaks all the analyses, and it's not even clear what the right optimization problem is anymore. Before you had the task of eliminating all but the correct hypothesis. Now what you want to do is intuitively gather enough information to make the right decision. So here's one way to make this precise. So suppose I run all the tests. Okay, I get to see the outcome of every single test. Then I still have some uncertainty about what the true action is. So my posterior distribution may still have probability mass uh, for different hypotheses. So the best I can really hope to do is take the action that maximizes my expected utility. Okay, let's call that A star. Now I can ask, do I really have to run all these tests? How can I gather enough information so that I prove to myself that I'm still going to make the right decision? Okay, so how can I cheaply test to guarantee that after stopping, I'm going to choose the right action? Okay, and uh, so, so this is you know, the natural generalization of this, uh, of this existing optimization problem. And now what we could do is we could try to understand how some of these existing approaches that are out there uh, work on this problem. So for example, one natural guess would be to try generalized binary search for this problem, right? Or we could try maximize information gain or myopically maximize value information um, and so on. Turns out none of those is adaptive submodular if there's noise. That wouldn't rule out that they work, but actually they empirically can do badly and I'll show you later. And you can actually theoretically prove that they have, um, have they can produce cost that's about n over log n uh, times the cost of the optimal policy. Okay? Good. So that means we have to look for a new criterion. So here's our proposal. So the idea uh, is, and that's the idea common to a lot of machine learning problems, is that we replace the noisy problem with a noiseless problem, essentially by introducing slack. <clears throat> so what we do is, we, what we can do is, we can basically create noisy copies of our hypotheses and annotate all our noisy hypotheses with the outcomes of all the tests. Okay, so what you basically do is, suppose um, in, the, in the case of this green disease here, the second and third test always are zero, but the first test could either come out zero or one. Okay, maybe zero is more likely than one. In this case, we have two copies of this green disease, one over here, one over here, but they're annotated with different vectors of out, uh, outcomes of, this, of these tests. Okay, the same thing for, for this orange uh, for, for, this, for this orange disease, right? For this orange disease, for example, obviously this third and, uh, and a second and third test come out zero and one, but the first one could either be zero and one. Okay, just for illustration purposes here. Now, um, what we, so, so, so now we have reduced the noisy case to the noiseless case, right? Because any of those hypotheses deterministically determines by construction the outcome of all the tests. And now we could run generalized binary search in this problem. But of course, the big issue is that these noisy hypotheses encode a lot more information that we need, right? Because all we need to do is we need to distinguish between noisy hypotheses that lead to making the same decisions. So what you can do is you can take all those noisy annotated hypotheses and group them into equivalence classes based on which action we would take in either case. And now we only need to distinguish between these equivalence classes rather than the individual elements in these equivalence classes. So one way to do this is to build a graph where we introduce an edge between any pair of noisy hypotheses in different equivalence classes. And the weight of these edges, we are just going to choose um, as the product of the uh, individual probabilities of these hypotheses. Okay, so if you have two very likely hypotheses, so this green one, this red one here, then the edge would have heavy weight. But if you look at these two uh, examples over here, then the edge would have very little weight. Okay, 
And now, suppose we see the outcome of one test, so the CX1 equals 1. In this case, we eliminate some of those noisy hypotheses. And of course, now we can also get rid of all these adjacent edges. OK? So every test eliminates now not nodes in this graph, but edges in this graph. And these edges basically measure our progress in being able to distinguish between these equivalence classes. And also notice that um, any optimal policy has to cut all the edges in this graph. Right? As, because as if there's still at least one edge, then there's some positive probability of confusing these two equivalence classes. Right? So we have to cover, get rid of all those edges. And so we can define the objective function as just the total mass of all the edges cut under a particular observation. Now, it turns out that's an adaptive submodular objective function. And that means the greedy algorithm is going to give us a new optimal solution for cutting all these edges. OK, so the cost of this greedy policy is at most a logarithmic factor more than the optimal policy. OK? And so this, uh, the, the, the factor here depends on some of the, the probability of, um, of, the, of the hypotheses. OK? And so this, and this is the first approximation algorithm for, uh, for non myopic VOI in general graphical models. And the idea is that you want to solve this non myopic problem, but you define some alternative some sub -sub substitute for the, uh, for, the, for the objective function. So you don't really optimize value transformation, but you optimize this some proxy objective function, which turns out to be adaptive submodular, and somehow guides you in the right direction. OK, so now for an application. <coughs> so yes, yes? I have a question on this. So it seems like the cost of computing the greedy is going to be Tremendously high. Yeah, so, so a very good point. So, so um, in practice, you would never actually implement the algorithm as such. But what it turns out what you can do is you only need to estimate the amount of mass uh, eliminated through the tests, and you can estimate that using sampling. So there's this uh, rejection sampling approach for estimating how much, uh, how much mass you can do. And also is a very efficient approximation to this objective function, which actually works really well in practice. OK, good. So this is what you can do. And so now for, for, for some actual application. Um, so we, we uh, so, so I'm, uh, started to collaborate with Colin Kammerer at Caltech, who's a neuroeconomist, or behavior, uh, behavioral ec economist at Caltech. And <clears throat> uh, one uh, interesting paradigm that they study in order to understand how people make decisions under uncertainty is called the Iowa gambling task. And in that task, subjects are presented two decks of cards that can flip through. These cards basically uh, have uh, so so the, the cards have different values. So, so you, you could either win, you could lose, or gain nothing. Okay? You flip through the cards, and you have these two decks of cards. You can look at all, both of them to somehow estimate how likely you are to win, lose, or gain nothing with respect to these cards. After you've gathered some information about that, uh, you have to then decide one of those decks of cards and draw a card and get paid based on that observation. And you get this equal number for, this, for the setting here, get equal number of trials for both of those cards. So you get the uh, information for these probabilities. So in some sense, what this test uh, encodes is a particular probability distribution over rewards. Okay? And suppose you have these two different uh, distributions. In the first setting, you win $10 with 70% chance, lose $10 with 30% chance. In the second setting, you win $10 with 30% chance and uh, gain nothing or lose nothing uh, with 70% chance. Who would uh, prefer the, uh, the left gamble? How many trials okay. do I get? Yeah. Well, one. Only one trial? Yes. Oh. Who would prefer the second one? OK, so there's, turns out there's some uh, heterogeneity, right? So, so the one that has higher expected utility is the first one, of course, right? The four dollar in expectation versus three in the second one. On the other end, the, the other one, you can, uh, in, the, in the right one, you can only win. Right? And so there's different competing hypotheses of how people make, uh, make, make these decisions, uh, such as, uh, for example, this hypothesis, just people maximize expected utility. Um, there's the prospect theory, which basically says that people may weigh losses stronger than they weigh gains. There's also portfolio optimization, which basically says that people weigh expected value versus variance versus skewness or other moments of the uh, distribution differently. Right? So there's basically different ways that, of looking at features of those probability distributions and encoding utilities over those. And uh, an interesting question in behavioral economy is trying to understand some of what is the variability in the population among those different theories. Does everybody behave the same, or what, what, uh, um, what makes them behave in a certain way, and what kind of situations? 
Okay, and now of course what we, uh, what we, every test requires to actually have the subject run through this, through this setting, right? So you have to come up with a set of these PDFs, of these stack of cards, and uh, gather some information, it's expensive. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to efficiently uh, gather a data as efficiently as possible. So you can cast this as a Bayesian experimental design problem where we have one latent variable, which is the theory that we try to identify, right? prospect theory, expected value, and so on. Uh, this has parameters right, that we also don't know. And all tests that we can run, the observations x1 through xn, are basically pairs of gambles. Okay, so any test that we can run is a particular pair of, of those gambles, of that, those decks of cards that we can show. And now um, all these different utilities and the parameters give us, uh, so all these different theories and parameters give us different utilities for each of those gambles. So we can try to model the pick uh, of, the, of the user as some kind of noisy indicator of the perceived difference between the utilities of those gambles. So this is some kind of softmax function which is used a lot in behavioral economics. So this is just the observation. And now we can try to figure out how should I test in order to figure out what's the true theory. Okay, and um, now you can run all sorts of different um, optimization algorithms to solve this problem. And so here's the result that we do. So this is based on simulations. I just sample from the model and compare these different theories so that we can get lots of trials. And x is the number of tests, y axis is the accuracy of identifying what the correct hypothesis is. And here's something interesting happens. Uh, it turns out that random already does fairly well and something that you see uh, quite a bit in active learning sometimes. Uh, and it turns out that some of this optimized criteria for this problem actually do worse than random for this application. Okay, and I can speculate offline of why, why I think this happens, but of course it's due to the fact that they uh, optimize, myopically optimize, so that you don't do any look ahead. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so for example, what happens in uncertainty sampling, that's easy to understand, so uncertainty sampling just picks the test about which you're most unsure what the outcome is, okay? But in this uh, task of distinguishing these different theories, that is quite problematic um, because if you have um, a particular pair of gambles where the utility of two different theories is equal, then that maximizes the uncertainty about the outcome, but also if you run this test, it doesn't tell you anything about the true theories. So in this case, the more uncertainty and the amount of information gathered about the theory is negatively correlated. Well, that's one reason why uncertainty sampling does really badly. Okay, but there's other reasons for the other objectives. Um, and so information gain based on the optimal design is, is doing better than random, but this uh, adaptive submodular criterion is actually outperforming um, information gain on this, on this particular task. So basically the output of this, uh, of the adaptive submodular uh, approach would be um, a sequence of, of studies with humans in choosing these pairs of gambles. Well, so it basically gives you an algorithm, it gives you a decision rule, right? Basically, yeah. So you wouldn't actually write down. Right, but for, for generating these, these, these yes. that's the application. Exactly, right, exactly. But you wouldn't actually write down this tree. You only would uh, somehow uh, expand the tree on the fly. And that means that the algorithm has to be very efi uh, efficient. And just to show that it's efficient, we actually use it in, in some human subject experiments. Oops. Um, where we, uh, so this is very preliminary, but we started to uh, run about uh, 11 uh, naive subjects on this, on this trial. Uh, so here, x axis is the number of tests, y axis is the probability of the classified type of the decision made at the end. And you can see that people actually behave differently. So uh, actually a fairly large fraction of people uh, chose the, uh, the highest maximum expected utility. Um, but here there's also uh, two subjects that uh, choose uh, behave according to prospect theory and there's some examples of the other uh, theories as well. So the question is, about, can we estimate the heterogeneity in the population? Can we uh, figure out how that depends on certain features of the environment and so on? Well, you're taking a decision science course in undergraduate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this, yeah, this is uh, yeah, the Caltech undergrad population, which may not be an unbiased sample of the general population. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, so this is the... So this is very, very preliminary, but so the main intention of this is not to draw any conclusions about these theories. It's, it's only to show that this algorithm is actually practical to run in real time. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is this. So before I want to conclude, I just want to give you, uh, tell you about one other project that's currently going on and some of these ideas connect. So one problem that we're really interested in is using community health sensors to uh, sense and respond to crisis. Okay, and so for example, I could use 
um, <coughs> advanced meters deployed in the smart grid to try to detect cascading failures, personal navigation devices to detect traffic jams. And one project that we have at Caltech and it's becoming a larger effort now is using um, <coughs> accelerometers in mobile phones in order to detect earthquakes. So we're building a community seismic network and the idea is that earthquakes basically behave according to two waves. So there's a primary wave, which is a sound wave, a compression wave that travels uh, a couple kilometers per second. And the uh, S wave, which is a secondary wave, which is the one that does the main damage, is a shear wave, travels less fast than the P wave. Okay? And so it means that if you can detect this P wave, it actually gives you some time to react uh, and possibly do early warning. Okay? And uh, just to give some ideas, Southern California has currently a seismic network that's about the resolution you would get in the LA area. Um, and uh, if you increase the resolution, if you were able to get uh, more data from more sensors, you would uh, be able to much more fine-grainedly be able to estimate somehow these seismic, uh, seismic waves uh, propagate over time. Okay? And so one way to gather data is we use these shake tables. You can put phones on these tables, play back recorded earthquakes, and see how these sensors behave. And then as we get these recordings, and uh, one big challenge in this problem is that these phones produce a lot of data. Okay? So uh, if you take about a million phones, would, they would produce about 30 terabytes uh, of data each day. Okay? And AT&T or Sprint wouldn't be very happy to constantly tra transmit that much uh, data over the phone. So you really have to make decisions of what you should send. And of course, that has decision theoretic implications because you have to make a decision should I raise an alarm or not. Right? But now you have to solve the second one. How, How long? It depends know? on the scenario, but for some of the scenarios considered, you can get about two minutes, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually uh, can help you, for example, stop elevators, um, uh, give warnings to cars to stop, um, and also some protect the infrastructure, shut valves, and so on. So, so there's potential um, of responding to these events. Okay, um, and so, so one, one approach that we take is we actually have uh, accelerometer data recorded from people. So this is maybe a person walking. And all what you can do is you can look at how seismic events look like played back on the phone and then superimpose them on this walking data. So you get this overlaid data. And now we can look at, uh, basically train a model of what normal activity looks like on the usual data by using density estimation techniques. And then look at the likelihood of the, of the observations, for example, during an earthquake. And you actually you can see that even so bigger events, you may even be able to detect uh, in some uh, activities. I mean, so typically you would only try to detect earthquakes while the phone is laying still. But for the major ones, you may be, you be able to figure out something that's going on while uh, people are using the phones. But now, of course, the question is, how do you calibrate this network? Okay, it's an anomaly effective base. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but yeah? So it's, it's, it's the probability of, of, uh, of seeing that if things are normal, basically. Right, right exactly. Right. Right. But now, of course, the question is, how do you choose this threshold? That's actually a really interesting problem, right? Because you have to choose this locally, but you have to choose this locally so that you make globally efficient decisions. Right? So you have to somehow calibrate that. And so we're currently looking at, so this is very much work in progress, using these ideas uh, of um, adaptive and online optimization of submodular functions sort of to calibrate this network. This is just a quick uh, um, idea of what's, what's currently going on. So to conclude, I told you about adaptive submodularity, and I think it's a really interesting generalization of submodularity to these adaptive problems. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the useful properties loved for classical submodular functions um, extend to the adaptive setting, like getting guarantees about the greedy algorithm, doing lazy evaluations, and getting these data-dependent bounds. There's actually a number of applications that can be shown to be adaptive submodularity, uh, like the stochastic set cover while marketing, active learning, based on experimental design. And what's nice is that it provides a unified view on the analysis for these different problems. So we can recover a number of results known in literature and get some extensions to that. But it also leads to new algorithms, like in the Bayesian experimental design problem that I mentioned to you in the, uh, in the end. That's it. How sensitive are your results to knowing that precise probabilistic model? Good question. <laughs> so uh, it turns out that um, for, for the maximization case, it's difficult to say something. But for the coverage case, so for example, if you would like to achieve a certain amount of market coverage in the viral marketing or in the active learning setting, um, you uh, get guarantees even against adversarially chosen realizations. So you can even get, um, if you start with a distribution, but basically the uniform distribution, then uh, you still get guarantees even against worst case chosen realizations. 
can you quantify the robust the robustness in some sense? Yeah, that's an interesting question for future work. So this is some kind of the at the end of the spectrum, right? If it's completely adversarial, you can still say something. But of course, you know, how things happen between exactly matching your prior versus uh, being completely off, there's a lot of uh, possible room to improvement. Any other questions? What's next? I told you some of the problems <laughs> that's next. So, but, uh, so, so I think one, the theory? Turn to the theory, yeah. yeah. So, so I think one, uh, one interesting question is, um, <clears throat> so in some sense you can cast all these information gathering problems as general part, uh, partially observable market position processes, right? right? But just using general purpose black box algorithms for that is, I think, really challenging because the state space is exponential with the number of observations you can make and the belief so the size of belief space is exponential in the size of the state space. So in some sense, it's doubly exponential with the number of tests you want to run. So it's extremely instructable. Um, and uh, nevertheless, you can get approximation guarantees for this class of PMDP. So of course, one question is, can someone push this further? And someone will say that, can you say something about more general planning problems? So this is one. The PMDP approximations, for example, so how adapt them to what those valuable value iteration kinds of functions uh, yes, exactly. Right. So, can, can you come up with approximation algorithms for certain types of PMDP? So, this is one interesting problem. But also, of course, these robustness uh, issues uh, that, that were just uh, raised as a in, uh, really interesting uh, discussion. And also, get, just getting a better idea of which problems are adaptive to modular. I mean, this is a new concept, right? So, we don't know how general this is. So, you have a domain that you don't know much about. And you are thinking about applying these adaptive submodular algorithms on that domain. Yep. So, what is the first clue, you, or how do you make a decision, like to say this domain is submodular or not? Okay. So, in, in general, trying to prove submodularity can be a bit tricky. <clears throat> but, so in some cases, it's not so hard, right? So, I showed you a proof on one slide for this adaptive learning problem, right? So, I mean, this is a really new concept. And that means that I, I think there's a number of low hanging fruit for, for some problems that are out there that people just haven't looked at. But uh, so in general, so I'm not sure about what's the right toolboxes for proving uh, adaptive submodularity, but uh, there are some operations that do preserve adaptive submodularity. So if you can, somehow, you can build more complicated adaptive submodular functions from simple adaptive submodular functions. And in the, in the paper, we discuss uh, some of those. Hmm. That may be one way of going about this. I mean, uh, a wild I thought would be that you can actually maybe Design artifacts to have this property for diagnosis in the future with, with guarantees. With artifacts? To actually just design machines, design machines that, that can give them this property as, as part of the design process for maintenance and diagnosis with, with, with guarantees. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Can you someone come up? Yeah? yeah it's kind of a wild idea. Yeah, 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 no, but uh, there may be something. <laughs> we can talk about this offline. Yeah. 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 Um, are there any additional constraints on submodularity that give you an even more optimal solution? Like strictly submodular? Very good question. So, uh, so for the classical notion of set functions, um, you can quantify the performance guarantee of the greedy algorithm in terms of a quantity called the curvature, so which basically means how strong is this uh, diminishing returns property? How quickly does it flatten out? And there's a way of quantifying that. And you can, uh, so, so an extreme example is linear functions. Right, for that, that don't have any, uh, any diminishing returns. So it turns out the greedy algorithm is optimal for linear functions. Okay? And so now, so between linear uh, one, right, optimal, and one minus one over e, there's some room. And you can quantify where you are. And we don't know what you can do for the adaptive case. So it's an interesting direction. And, and also, the other thing I was going to ask, in the submodularity, they showed that the greedy is the best boundary. You can, yeah. Do you have the same result for adaptive? So well, uh, it's a strict generalization of the case, right? So, so unless you make further restricting assumptions, you can't really say that. Because, so, so, so you can always, um, so any submodular optimization problem is an adaptive submodular problem where all the observations are deterministic. Right. So in some sense, all the hardness results for submodular functions carry over. And since the lower bound, so the upper bounds, for the performance guarantees for the greedy algorithm match up, there's not really room for doing that. Yes, Rich. A any idea how the quality of the solutions degrades with failure of the adaptive submodularity assumption? I mean, but you could have like epsilon yeah. submodularity yeah. with yeah. less than or equal to held, 
with an epsilon on one side. Very good. So, so we call it alpha. So very good. If it's basically, uh, so if you implement the greedy algorithm that's only off by a factor of alpha, uh, then you still, all the guarantees go. There's a lot, there's uh, uh, a bunch of uh, results known for the classical case and they still carry over to the adaptive case. So either if the objective function that you try to optimize is close to a submodular function or if you can't implement the greedy algorithm exactly, you can st uh, still do something. So, so I guess it might also be an empirical question in addition to a theoretical question. I mean, think about boosting, for example, yep. which makes a strong assumption of weak learning. Yeah. And that's not satisfied by most learning methods yep. that we boost. And yet boosting in practice works extremely well yep. over a wide range of boosted algorithms. And I'm wondering if the same thing might be true here. That in fact, adaptive submodularity is great when you can get it. Yeah. But in fact, you do quite well using these methods, even when it's not really quite true. That's very good. So but it's, it's really difficult to answer that theoretically. So, uh, as, as, as it is for boosting. As it's for boosting, yes. You could, so, could, so, could so basically you're saying that this modularity as a heuristic. Yeah. Right. So but <coughs> as an anecdotal example, so I, I told you about this, for example, mean squared prediction error, so the variance reduction. And so, so if you say you want to monitor temperature in a building, right, or in a lake, then uh, you may want to care about the expected reduction in mean squared error. That objective function is uh, not always submodular, let's count the examples. And it depends a bit on, the, so for, for Gaussians, and it depends a bit on the, some of the structure of the covariance matrix, and there's some stability results on that. And so there's some indications that for some applications it is submodular, but these are often violated in practice, even though the algorithms work really well. So it worked better than state-of-the-art existing search techniques. So I mean, that's I don't know how, how that's uh, if, uh, of the same example in the adaptive case, but at least for the classical case, there's hope in this direction. So, so then a related question. Um, do you think there might be cases where relaxing the adaptive submodularity requirement might actually yield improved solutions? I mean, for example, this does happen with boosting, right? Mm -hmm. So typically, if we go from something that's provably weak to something that's uh, not not so weak, yeah. we often actually get better results with boosting. And I'm wondering if there could be a similar thing here, where adaptive submodularity is great from the theoretical point of view, but in fact, in practice, we do somewhat better if we relax it in certain ways. But what what do you mean? To, so, so so what is so the question is what's a suitable candidate algorithm? So I think one one issue is people love greedy algorithms, yeah. right? And they often work really well. My question is, is why, right? And that may be an answer to at least some of those problems, right? So, so and, and I think one of the answers could be that in some applications that maybe lack submodularity, the greedy algorithm could still do well. Because it's because the function is close to adaptive submodularity, or, or at least in this somehow space of solution that the greedy algorithm searches that contains somehow uh, at least sufficiently good, many good solutions, uh, uh, the submodularity is, is satisfied, and uh, that gives some indication of why, why you should have good performance. Oh, well, thanks very much.